Today we are celebrating Christmas in July. Why? Because we have a supersized edition of our episode commentary today, where we are covering the classic season two holiday themed episode, Silent Night. But what makes it supersized? Well, how about a cameo by the elusive other Knight Rider historian, Mr. A.J. Palmgren himself? What? That's not enough? Well, how about an exclusive interview with Tino himself, Mr. Paul LaGreca? What? You want even more? Well, too bad, because that's all we've got. Happy Holidays! It's a scary Christmas for Michael when he tries to find a runaway. Those guys don't seem to have the Christmas spirit. Can Michael and Kit deck the halls and the trucks on Night Run? Be there! Production 57817, Silent Night. This episode was written by Robert W. Gilmer, Janice Hendler, and Stephen B. Katz. It was directed by Bruce Kessler. This episode originally aired on NBC Sunday night, 8 p.m., December 18th. 1983. It was filmed from October 26th through November 4th of 1983. It was the 32nd episode to air, but the 33rd episode to be produced. This episode had a number of working titles during the script development to include The Fiddler, Fiddler's Dream, Night and the Gypsy, before they finally settled on Silent Night. All right, let's dig in. And we're going to start with this opening uh, scene where you see the title. This footage that they're playing in the background is a scene from the 20-minute pilot presentation that was filmed way back in April of 1982 for Glenn Larson to try and sell the series to NBC. It's hard to tell here, but this is the original pilot kit, the one that had the, the stock-looking front nose, uh, elongated hood, thinner scanner, and you can see we move ahead, it cuts to a different scene, and we're still in some of that pilot presentation footage. So the neat thing is, even though the original complete pilot presentation hasn't emerged yet, we haven't found it yet, throughout the course of the series, we get different snippets of the footage that they filmed for that presentation. So until we find the actual pilot presentation, this is as good as it gets, but... Still need to see well into season two, and we're seeing the original pilot kit still. This is a holiday-themed episode. It is one of only two holiday-themed episodes in the series, the other being Halloween night. Here, obviously, it's Christmas. There's not too many references. Obviously, we're not going to see, you know, snowfall or anything like that in Southern California, but we do see the foundation decorated a little bit. A little later, we see April decorating a tree, we hear Michael and Kit talk about gifts and gift giving and things like that. So um, kind of neat to uh, incorporate the holidays in a couple episodes. Here's Michael driving. Um, this episode makes great use of the hero car as the insert car. So if you recall in our uh, previous uh, episode commentaries, in season one, the hero car was was mainly used as the insert car. The insert car is the one that is connected to a camera truck and it's pulled while the actors inside act. And for season two, they switched from using the hero car to using what was formerly what we call the backup to the hero car, which is the car that we currently own that's in the Peterson Museum right now. Um, but for this episode, they primarily used the hero car um, for the insert shots. And we can tell that because of the overhead console, which by the way is missing a couple buttons here, not surprising. We can tell it's got the regular coat hooks, not the chrome coat hooks of, of our insert car, uh, things like that. So chances are there was probably some mechanical issue with the uh, actual insert car that they used for season two. So they has to substitute back in 
the uh, hero car for most of this episode. And we are back in the town of Covina, California. Uh, last time we saw this little town was back in season one in a nice and decent little town. And it was used for the town of Alpine Crest in the episode. But here we are um, now back in Covina. And I always enjoyed this scene because it starts just with this lady carrying um, some merchandise she purchased crossing the street. And then the uh, circus van comes up, beeps her horn, slams on the brakes. But even though these are the, the bad guys... Um, if you think about it, I always thought this was funny. This girl is in the wrong. She's jaywalking and she's running across the street and she clearly could have seen the van had she looked left. So um, just a funny observation. Continuing. We then uh, come over to the bank where the uh, impending bank heist will uh, be happening here in a few moments. We can see this is the bank of R. Gilmer. And that's an in-joke, a reference to the... Uh, story writer of this episode, Robert W. Gilmore. You can see it's posted on both sides of the bank, and we can see it's posted on the door here, grand opening. This building is still there. Um, I took a selfie in front of it uh, a couple years ago, and uh, we also see it in the background of a nice and decent little town. The neat thing about Covina, um, if you were to visit it today, it's almost completely frozen in time from the way it was back during the Knight Rider filming days. So if you're ever in the area, I highly recommend going there because you'll see all of these same buildings in the background. It's a very, um, it's a very neat little town, a very decent little town, if you will. Um, and it's worth going to. It's neat just parking and walking the streets and seeing all these filming locations. So here we can see um, the bank heist in progress in front of the bank. And if you look in the um, mirror, in the reflection, you can actually see the camera operator. Here he is with his hat. Here's the uh, camera itself with the film reels on top. So neat little uh, blink and you'll miss it moment there. And then you can see Michael coming around the corner. This is a nice point of view shot of... Uh, kit and this is downtown Covina you can see the Covina theater here again all still there today and just to put it in perspective you know that uh, alley to alley turbo boost in a nice and decent little town it actually takes place right here at this alley so um, between this where this green awning is and this brown awning kit launched from this direction and launched across this street and landed on the other side so and then Kit's talking about, you know, looking for some formal wear shops in the area. And I thought, you know, especially after what we discovered back in Brothers Keeper, whenever they were looking for a place to plant the bomb, to, to put the bomb where it would explode, where no one would get hurt, and it was right under the Hollywood sign, I thought, well, let's just see where this is. You know, is this really, you know, close to Covina, where they're looking for a formal wear shop? So he's in Covina, and the first place he stops at is right by Dodger Stadium on, uh, it says Pasadena Freeway. So if we look at it now, uh, it's about a 40-minute drive. So Covina's over here, and uh, Dodger Stadium is right here. So right about this area is where they were identifying as one formal wear shop. So that's about 40 minutes away. So I suppose that that's, you know, in the general area. And then the next one, the map then moves to this dot, uh, San Rafael Hills near uh, Greenwich Road. So let's see how far that is out of curiosity. And again, 40 minutes. So um, the first map point was right down here, Dodger Stadium. Here's the second one. And let's check out the third one. And the final one over here uh, on Vineland Avenue near Hamlin Street look at it today um, about 51 minutes so the first location was here second location was right about here third locations here so this is one of those odd times when you know the inserts match up with the storyline so it's completely plausible that the three formal wear shops are about 40 minutes away from where they are pretty cool huh and then we see uh, another shot of Kit still driving down the road. And right here, this building right here, is the Alpine Crest Hotel from a nice and decent little town. 
And uh, we see here, here's Tino off to the side. It's a bl He's a blur right now, but here's that Covina Theater. And um, here's a uh, cameo by an early third gen Firebird. This is probably an 82 or 83. It looks like a looks like a, a Firebird and not a Trans Am. It's hard to tell from the blur. It's got the silver wheel covers, but um, there you go. I like pointing those out. And here's the van pulling into a, a spot kind of off the main drag. We see some people up here with some kids watching the filming. We, um, during our walking tour of Kavina, we found this location and here's what it looks like now. And then Tino comes around the corner and I always want, I always like finding places like this because, you know, I, I see this broken concrete. I'm like, well, is there evidence? Is it still broken? Was it fixed? Is this completely changed? So you can see here that it's, um, you know, the area is pretty much untouched, just like we were talking about. And then Tino steals the watch, runs out, gets hit by Kit, and clearly not uh, Paul LaGreca. And then uh, we see Michael helping Tino up, and another Blink and You'll Miss It cameo. Here's uh, Hal Frizzle. Uh, we've mentioned many times one of the most uh, prolific background guys in all of Knight Rider, part of the stunt team. There he is right there just walking down the street. This is really neat. So uh, Michael and Tino are driving in kit. We see this point of view shot and the bad guys pull up on uh, Michael's side. But just take a look in the background at all of these people. You have to remember Knight Rider had now been on the air over a year. The first season was done. They were well into filming of the uh, second season. A number of the second season episodes had aired and the popularity of the show had really taken off. So look at all these people that came out to watch the filming of the show. Normally, you know, this wouldn't get caught on camera. So it's really, really cool to just see, you know, who was actually there during filming. And there's just tons of people. Pretty neat. You're correct. And then we come over to this scene with the bad guys coming around the bend. And fact, even though this is off the main drag, this building, all this is stuff is still the there. Season, See the guy, bad possibly. guys lost the hubcap right there coming around the, the bend. Entire, no, that's not true. And the obligatory uh, turbo okay, boost let's actually check. Let's, uh, let's faces check and uh, postures. I think I should put together a compilation video of, of just all of series. these stuff. Uh, that was looks and faces. Maybe I'll do that. That'd be neat. On NBC. Anyways, car launches. Although, this is the roll cage acrylic window jump car. We can see it's got a skid plate. Hard to see here, but it's got bolts running through all of the hubcaps to hold them on. My opinion, this uh, Taco Bell is actually rerun, still there it? today. That's a question that we can answer because all Coming we have to do is for a landing there. You can see the bolt right there. Go to the database. See the bolt right in the middle of the hubcap. That's Let's the go to the on. database, shall we? The, uh, these fender sure. air extractors were also riveted on too, so Just they wouldn't fly off. They can do that. And then we come to the uh, Woodfield Police Joe, you can Station, edit me which in reality is the, the Covina Police Department. Well, and we also saw loads, this building as the Alpine Crest don't have to Police look Department up my hand in paper from a nice and decent little town. So. Although well, that would be an interesting um, story to see. Filming location. Maybe that's something we'll share with our I always Patreon enjoyed this supporters. shot. Uh, it's very rare you get to see Maybe. this angle of the hero car. But uh, standing you can see by the in the headrest here and uh, you know the dash is all lit up. At this point, this dash really didn't do too much. The they were able to cycle the LED. Well, I should have just gone from memory Someone because I would have gotten it right. Yes, that's it was to, December. Uh, it was December 18th, 1983. That's when that episode was originally aired. We interrupt this broadcast for a special message from AJ Palmgren, the other Knight Rider historian, who has returned from a top secret three year long overseas mission for the Foundation for Law and Government to bring you some thoughts on this episode. Ah, Silent Night. Yes, it was a truly unique episode. And yes, this is A.J. Palmgren, the other Knight Rider historian that uh, some of you think has been MIA for quite some time now. The truth is, I've just been silently working behind the scenes. But I'm still here. Silent Night. Well, it actually is the first episode that was never rerun on NBC. The first one. And that's why it was so unique, because at the time when I was... And, you know, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. Who decided, Joe and fans, who decided 
when an episode was rerun on NBC and when it wasn't? Who was the program director that made those decisions? We actually don't have a name that I know of. Maybe Joe can correct me on this, but uh, we don't know who that is. Maybe someday we'll figure it out. Maybe that person is still with us, and uh, maybe we'll be able to talk to him. You never know. You never know. Anyway, digressing just a bit, checking my notes, in other ep- episodes that were never rerun, uh, and I should point it, yeah, I did say it was the only episode in the second season that was never rerun, and it's the first episode in the entire series that was never rerun. Moving on to the third season, The 19th Hole is the next episode that was never rerun. It was played on March 10th, 1985, never rerun again. Same with Night and Nerd. March 17, 85, never rerun again. Moving on to the fourth season. Out of the Woods, January 17, 86, was never rerun. Same with Deadly Nightshade, can you believe it? January 24, 86. And Hills of Fire, February 14, 86, never rerun. Now, of course, these I can believe because in the fourth season, of course, this was when Knight Rider was canceled, and I believe it was canceled early enough in the summer that it didn't get the full reruns that the previous three seasons got. So you would have this particular phenomenon. It would actually make sense because Knight Rider was run on NBC for fewer weeks in the fourth season than it was for all three other seasons because they reran it throughout the summer before the next, uh, the next fall season premiere. And, of course, there was never a fifth season of Knight Rider unless you follow fan fiction, but that's another story entirely. Anyway, we left off at Hills of Fire, February 14, 86. Night Flight to Freedom, also never rerun, February 21st, 86. Fright Night, never rerun, March 7th, 86. Night of the Rising Sun, March 14th, 86. And as I alluded to earlier in this monologue by me, the worst episode ever created, Voodoo Night, April 4th, 86, was thankfully never rerun. But we should talk about other things, like Argyle Socks for Devin. Michael, you didn't think I would get Argyle Socks for you, did you? It's going completely from memory here. We can't, we can't go through the commentary of this without discussing the Argyle Socks. But then there's some other things that are very interesting about this episode. For example, uh, just in recent years... Uh, I had the opportunity to meet none other than Tino. Paul LaGreca himself, a fantastic gentleman, tells some very interesting stories about the shooting of this episode. Anyway, definitely met Paul and uh, had a number of interesting uh, one-on-one conversations with him, or maybe it was just one with a small group of people at dinner. And he shared a fascinating story about an encounter with uh, uh, someone on the crew... Uh, of Knight Rider, and this fascinating story is definitely not something I'm going to tell to the general public, but it is something that I can make available to our Patreon supporters for sure. And there was this very moment when he was talking about this person, and I'm thinking, I think I've heard of this person. As a matter of fact, I think I even have a picture of this person. So while I'm thinking this and we're having dinner, I'm going through the uh, the Knight Rider archives on my uh, phone here that I've stored online. I'm trying to access them, and I found the picture I was looking for, and I showed it to him. And I said, Paul, is this the person that you had this encounter with? And he said, oh, wow, yes, it is. You call yourself a Knight Rider historian, and the fact that not only I just bring this person up and you produce a picture of them, (laughs) he was kind of blown away, so... If you want to hear about who that person was and what that encounter was, I, now you're definitely going to have to become a Patreon supporter. So, But there's so much more where this comes from. So at this point, I'll just let Joe continue to talk to us about Silent Night. Such a great episode. Such a great play on words. Joe, take it away. And we see this uh, above shot whenever they open the T-tops. There's something laying on the windshield here. My guess is something related to um, lighting. I I don't know for sure. And I'm not sure what this is right here with this T-handle. 
any of you guys recognize this, let me know. It's a reflection of probably some of the rigging needed to get this shot. But if you look right here, you can see the paint peeling on the T-top bar. Because remember, these cars, whenever they were dented or need repainted or anything, they would literally just scuff and squirt them. They wouldn't, you know, sand down paint layers or do anything. They would just blast new paint layers on. And that's why most of the surviving cars to this day have such thick coats of paint on them. It's because, you know, they, they were on a, a tight schedule. They had to paint them and get them out the door ready for shooting the next day. Here we have a great shot uh, once the T-tops open. And uh, these T-tops on the Hero car, you can't see them in this angle, but we've shown them in previous uh, episode commentaries. There's little hinges uh, that attach to the T-top bar and attach to the T-tops that allow the T-tops to open like this. They weren't powered, so they were manually opened and closed off camera. That's why you don't see the top, you know, this, it's, the frame cuts it off up here and below because there was probably someone just grabbing them, opening them, and closing them again. It wouldn't be until the third season that we actually get working, a working auto roof, but we'll talk about that when we get to that point. Um, also, note that uh, Michael's comm link is not the correct comm link. He's just wearing a generic watch there. So Nick's walking. The three uh, bank robbers meet him here. And this is also in Convena. I thought it'd be neat to kind of look at it today. So keep note of this uh, cement block wall, the step on it, the building here. So 626 Grand Avenue in Covina. If we look here, there's that same building. There's that same wall. There's the railroad track, which made it easy to find. And you can go back here. And we come over here and there was a field here. Let's see if there's still a field there. And... Eh, looks like a parking lot and a farmer's market type of deal here, but this is the area that that scene took place in right there. And then we have uh, Marta's Flower Shop, which is just down the road from this uh, Grand Avenue and East Wingate Street. So let's take a look at that. So just to put it in perspective, that scene we just showed you with Nick and the Thugs was right here. The flower shop is right here, which makes sense, right? Because in the storyline, Nick left the flower shop and was walking, and this is where they did it. So once again, this episode, you know, ties things together nicely. So we go over here, there's the flower shop, which in reality is a flower shop, which is kind of neat. You can see here, looks pretty much the same, same uh, walkway, same exterior, just a different flower shop. And then the first commercial break of the episode has Michael driving off with this, uh, you know, row of cars in a turning lane. I point this out because this exact scene is reused at the very end of this episode where Michael is driving away and then it fades off to, you know, the end credits of the episode. So you can watch it and you see these exact same cars parked there. So they used it here and then they reused it at the end of the episode. So here we have the bad guys at uh, Tino's shack. So we can see here, this is Steven Liska, who played Casey. And then uh, this is, I think, Robert Miranda, who played Paolo. And then we have David Provol, who played Skip, who was the, the third bank robber. But if you look closely, this is not him. This is probably a stunt driver, but these are the actual two actors there. Tino's pressing some buttons, get some smoke release going, and uh, the last frame of this scene before they cut, you can see the film crew over here to the right uh, with camera operator. It looks like there's two guys there, maybe a slate marker. So here we have uh, Tino has finally convinced Michael to drive. This is um, not the insert car, not the hero car. This is another car. This is one of the train wreck cars. We saw this car previously from the inside in Return to Cadiz and in Ring of Fire. It didn't have an overhead console at that time. It was pretty bare bones. They've added an overhead. It's a blank one. There's no buttons or cutouts or anything. You can see the hole for the sun visor there, which has been removed. And for those of you who really, really know 82 through 84 Firebirds and Trans Ams, we can see that this is not the Pirella cloth found in 82s. This is the Palex cloth or Palex cloth found in 83 and 84. So we know that this car, well, I mean, the door panel could have been changed, but this is an 83. This is a train wreck car. And then we see here, Tino moves his head and we can see that the back speaker cover is held on by a crooked piece of masking tape. After Tino's joyride, Tino moves over, Michael gets in, we see the back seat bottom is missing, and in its place is some kind of a box. I'm not sure exactly what this is. 
Uh, looks like there might be a knob here, and I, I don't know what that's for. So we move to uh, these insert, insert shots here. This is the hero car again. I'm uh, pretty sure this was filmed on a soundstage um, that they darkened. And they were just kind of, you know, shaking the car to make it look like it was um, moving. So uh, it's hard to see here. But if you look really, really close, you can just see the white wire right there. That's what that is. White wire makes another appearance, barely. And then we have this really cool shot. This is recycled footage from season one, although we never see it in season one. It was filmed during season one. This is um, one of the, the season one front nose. You see the acrylic blackouts still in place. We see the triple fog lights as opposed to the double fog lights of season two. And here's the inside of the hero car. You can see between the time they filmed the scenes earlier and these scenes, they've added the buttons back on or this scene was filmed first and the buttons fell off. I don't know, but we've got the buttons there, albeit the wrong color. This top one should be yellow, but I digress. So Michael gets out of kit and uh, asks him to pop the trunk, of which he does. And obviously Kit can't really pop the trunk by himself. There's actually a man right here laying down in the back seat. And if you watch this, you can see him moving a little bit. There's a trunk pull cable right behind this passenger seat. So this guy is laying there specifically to pop the trunk while uh, for, to film this scene. So Michael and Marta cut off um, Uncle Stefano and uh, his uh, gypsy crew. And uh, a couple things to note here. First, this guy driving here is part of the Knight Rider crew. I don't know if he was transportation or whatnot. And I've seen him before in backgrounds. His name is escaping me at this very moment. But if you look, he's actually wearing a Knight Rider crew hat. So right here it says Knight and Rider, and then there's the chess piece right there. Pretty neat, huh? And then we cut and we see the scene of Marta. These stairs in the background, this was filmed at Universal Studios Backlot. These are the stairs that lead up to the Psycho House, which we see prominently in um, Halloween Night. We already saw it kind of in the background of Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death in Season 1, but that's what these are, the steps for the Psycho House. So then we move ahead and cuts back to this, and then there's now a bigger crew around him. Here's that uh, crew guy, and then when they zoom in and have this lady uh, talking to Stefano, all of a sudden the driver has mysteriously disappeared. And then you come back out, and he's back. There he is right there. Michael and Marta get in, and the T-top on this car was not properly seated. This side is, is in on the pins, but they didn't tuck this glass under the bar of the T-top. So when Michael closes the door, the air pressure, because the windows were up, pops the T-top off just a little bit. So here's um, one of the uh, bad guys shooting at Tino out in the cornfield. And this is supposed to be Steven Liska, who played Casey, but obviously this is a stunt double driving the... Uh, the machine. And then we see uh, Kit launching. Once again, this is the uh, roll cage acrylic window jump car. We move ahead of scene. We can see the heavy roll cage. We can see the stunt driver with his, all his protection harnesses in the helmet there. And then we move here and take a look at this. So this is full, si full scale, obviously. This is a real Trans Am, a real... Um, farm implement here and then when we move forward we cut to a miniature and just look how this differs right so here we still have the two small windows a big window but um this this arm here is not there for the miniature but who's going to notice right well we are anyways so then we move to this um close-up shot of the reaction shot of Hasselhoff and Marta watching the this machine getting shredded. A couple interesting things to note here. This is one of the early appearances of uh, one of the train wreck cars. This is the manual transmission car. From what we know and from what we've heard talking to Jack Gill and some others, it seems like they only had one manual transmission car, and that was this one. And you can see here, they hadn't even replaced the windshield yet with a, a clear version. It's, this is still the factory GM windshield that has the tint across the top. Those were replaced because whenever they were filming interiors, they didn't want the tint to obstruct the view of the actors. And you can also note that this car has tan-colored A-pillars right here, A-pillar covers. 
you couldn't get tan colored a pillars uh, covers from the factory these were painted so my guess is and it's not really a guess because i know some more history on this car which i'll reveal in a minute um, that whenever they were spray bombing the interior this this car from the factory did not come with a tan interior it was a gray interior because we know exactly what this car uh, is. We know the VIN of it, we know the specs of it, all that stuff. So this had a gray interior. So whenever they spray bombed all these plastic pieces to turn them tan for, for kit, they also sprayed these A-pillars. And this was the only car they did it in. And you'll see these tan A-pillars well throughout season three in this car. This is actually the same car that we see. Um, we'll see it in a couple episodes in A Knight in Shining Armor whenever Kit does his reverse turbo boost. That's this car. But it's probably most well known for its season three appearances. First, it appears as car in Kit versus car for a few scenes. And then this is the car that is ultimately um, gutted and the engine's removed and it's thrown in the acid pit for Junkyard Dog. And then after it's pulled out of the acid pit, um, this is the car that, you know, that, that appeared with the, the acid etching on the outside and, and all that. But um, for season four, this is the car that would be transformed into one of the two Super Pursuit Mode cars. So they had, they had a Super Pursuit Mode car that was static, full-time, none of the pieces extended. They also had one that didn't have an engine that was filled with hydraulics that allowed it to be transformed into the Super Pursuit car. This is the latter of those, the hydraulic Super Pursuit car. So unfortunately, it met its end after the show ended. This is one of the cars that was crushed. But this is one of its early appearances as a stunt car in Knight Rider. Boy, isn't it amazing? <laughs> I bet you probably think, how the heck does he know all that information from this one scene? Well... That's what uh, years and years of training at the Knight Rider Academy will teach you. Anyways, so I wanted to point this out. <clears throat> and this isn't something I ever noticed in all the times I watched this episode until doing this commentary. If you remember at the start of the episode and throughout the episode, there were three bank robbers. So in this scene, you see the one shooting and one of the other bank robbers jumps off the machine and runs. Well... We never see or hear from this third guy again. During the fight at the end of this episode, Michael and Tino fight and, and, and uh, take out two of these bank robbers. But that third one is never talked about or seen again. So he apparently got away and is on the run. So I just thought that was neat. Just this one blink, you'll miss it scene. You're supposed to be focused on him shooting, but in reality, this guy's running and he's never caught. So... And then here's the scene at the very end I was talking about where um, they reuse this footage from the first commercial break of the episode. Okay, so normally this would be the end of our episode, and it is the end of our commentary. However, we have a special treat for you. Our uh, Knight Rider historian special correspondent, Jacob Peterson, took the time to uh, interview Paul LaGreca, who played Tino in this episode. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, take a listen, and um, we'll see you next time for our uh, next episode, A Knight in Shining Armor. It's all about Night Rider when I have the pleasure of talking to Paul LaGreca, uh, who played Gypsy Boy Tino in the second season Night Rider episode, Silent Night. I've looked very much forward to this conversation as I've been friends with Paul on Facebook for some years now. Um, and uh, I like his often very spiritual posts. Paul is a man of very broad reach. Uh, during his life, he has uh, been to Hollywood. He has pursued a life as a missionary in one of the strictest Catholic um, uh, orders. He's also met Mother Teresa, just to mention a few things. All of that uh, you'll be able to read more about in his memoirs, The Boy Behind the China Cabinet. A um, fantastic book, uh, I can highly recommend it. Uh, it was published last year in 2020, where it also uh, was award winning in uh, the Amazon category Spirituality. But to today, we're going to talk about his role as Tino in Knight Rider. And I think Paul must have been one of the non regulars on the show 
that has been most in and around the kit cars. So I look very much forward to hear what he has to say about uh, being in the cars and filming in and around the cars. So I hope you enjoy this uh, conversation uh, very much. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Lagreca, it is. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. It's good to see you finally, <laughs> face to face. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's get going. And uh, yeah, we have it. We have it rolling behind here uh, with, with the intro. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I've watched it before we talk now, and and I've uh, I've, I've uh, noticed that that it takes seven, six, seven minutes before you actually are, are in in the episode. So I think that that you, you should just take good time to talk about how you got the role as uh, as Tino and Nadra. Sure. So um, I had gotten to Hollywood in June of uh, 1983, and uh, I had started sending out pictures and resumes to agents. And there was an agent that was very interested in called Flo Joseph, selected artist agency. And she started, she just believed in me and started shooting my picture out there. So um, I was called in, she goes, you, you need some experience. You have to say yes to small parts. I'm like, I have no issue with that. That's fine. I just don't want to do extra work. But she said, no, this is a role. And Airwolf is going to be a new pilot. Go in and interview for it. So it was a silent role where I would have to hold up a coin in a pool and get shot at by the actor David Hemmings, who's a famous British actor. And um, what an opportunity to work with Ernest Borgnine, Jan Michael Vincent. So I went for the interview and I was a New York actor, was committed and uh, I did very well. And on the way out of the audition, I saw somebody crying at her desk. It was a secretary who was upset because her cat was dying. And I stopped to talk to her to give her a little comfort and a casting director walking down the hall by the name of Mel Johnson saw me and he says, can I talk to you? Are you here for an audition for Knight Rider? And I said, no, I'm here for Airwolf. He said, do you have a second? And so he said, please come with me. He said, we just lost our, our Tino for Monday's episode of Knight Rider. Why weren't you submitted for this? I said, well, maybe I was, but you guys didn't call me in. <laughs> he said, all right. He said, I'm going to take you to April Webster. She's the casting director. We're stuck. You look just like the guy. Um, and read. And April sat down with me. Lovely, lovely lady. Um, she was pregnant. She was a Mother Earth type. She looked at me. And after I read, she said, that was good. She goes, do you think you can carry a one hour TV episode or however long it was? And I said, me, I could do it. I was made for this. <laughs> so she said, here's what I want you to do. Take the script, go home and read it. Call me back. Let me know if you like it. And then, of course, I liked it. In the meantime, I'm going to call Glenn Larson. And tonight, I need you to come back to Universal to read for him. The director is going to be there. If they like you, you're working on Monday. And, and I got the part. But I will tell you this. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to get it because when I walked in, there were two other guys. So she had called in. Like, you have to be care. You have to have options. So uh, but I felt it from the minute I read Tino. It was natural. It, there was no effort. Um, the words flowed from my mouth effortlessly. And when you're acting, sometimes you pick up a script and you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to make this real? It just feels so hard in my mouth, in my body. It's not me. Tino was me. And um, he was a wise guy. And I'm a New York wise guy. So uh, I, so when I got the part and then I, I realized that if I hadn't stopped to talk, to talk to that woman, I wouldn't have gotten the part. And I also got Airwolf. And so it was a double win. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's how I got it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so, so uh, Paul, can you talk about how much did you get paid for a role like this? Uh, it, it must have been yeah, a week, maybe eight or nine days of, of the... Of the of yeah. The well, you know, your salary is, you know, back then it was different. You know, there's different kinds of Screen Actors Guild contracts. But, you know, a contract like that for a guest star back then depends on how much experience you have. It depends on, you know, because 
back then there was something called a price book. So they, uh, casting people could open it up and say, Paula Greca's price is $5,000 for the week, right? Or I do two more shows. Now I, I went up to $7,000 a week. So it really, you know, that's kind of how it worked back then. It could be anywhere from scale, which was 2,500 a week to $10,000 a week, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Now we see that, that the episode is, is uh, going on here and, and it's shooting on location. It won't be long, then, then you, will, uh, you will steal the, the gold watch from, uh, from yes. the bank robbers. Um, these guys were great. They were so much fun, these three. We yeah. had a great time. And you, 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 got, you, got, you, you have time to, to talk with them and connect oh, Sure, them. Yeah. sure. David Proval, one, the, uh, the one in the blue shirt who I'll point out, he was on The Sopranos. He, he did great. Robert Miranda, the tall guy with the bald head, he went on to do a bunch of tough guy stuff. So he was in um, Sister Act. He was uh, one of the thugs that worked for um, Dean Stockwell. Uh, and, then, um, and then, of course, Stephen Liska is the third one. Stephen's great. He just did a bunch of, of episodics in L.A. He's still around. All three of them are, actually. Yeah. Great guys. We, we laughed a lot. <laughs> okay. So how was that to be an extra? And, and th this was uh, your, your very first uh, acting. Uh, not in front of the camera. No, no. This was my first guest star. It yeah, was okay. a it was a yeah. big spot. I had I had done TV. I had done um, stuff in New York with Woody Allen, Sidney Lumet. Look, I was already in front of the camera, but this was big because when you're a guest star, you have to carry the episode. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big, big job. Yeah, and I, I know that all the Night Rider fans out there, they know that, that you definitely carry this episode. Um, it, it really brings Thank you. A, a, a quality that, that uh, and yeah, a, a, and a different type of quality than what we've seen in, in other Night Rider shows. Thank it's, you. It's, it's, I appreciate uh, that. So, no. uh, it's, it's really, really a, a, a fantastic role. Have, have you any memories from shooting on location? Um, you know, out yes. in, in the real world? Yeah, there were people everywhere when because David was very popular. And when we shot the, all this, there were people lining the streets here. So here's the scene where I get hit by the car. There were just you'll see the people on the street um, once I get hit. OK, oh, this is the scene where so there was a scene before this that was cut. There was a scene where my my father dies. And I just said goodbye to him in the summit in the graveyard. I get it made no sense to keep it. And then I notice the bad guys here, and I'm intrigued by them, so I follow the van. And uh, <laughs> you know, there were people everywhere for here; they were all on the side. Yeah, we um, we, we get a couple of uh, a couple of shots where we, shots. where you can really see that, that, that there are a lot of spectators on the on the side. Yes. Of, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, and uh, Tino was a Tino. The character of Tino is a he was a lost little bit of a lost kid looking for adventure. You know, he was excited. The watch excited him. Um, a nice piece of a, or, you know, my earlum. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, this was tough because I had to toss that coin and catch it. I'm like, why are you making me do that? I mean, I I think I dropped it like, <laughs> and then uh, yeah, and I run away here. Uh, but growing up with my brothers, I have five older brothers. So I was accustomed to this kind of energy of older guys at you. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it was very natural for me. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the stunt scene that, 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 that comes now, I, I guess it's not you rolling over, over the hood of... Uh, no, that was uh, Jack Gill, the yeah. stunt act, yeah, the stunt double. And right here's where you, there's me, there's Jack, Jack, and now cut back and it's me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now you asked me, one of your questions was, did you get to talk to the people? I did. Actually, one of the extras here was married to the sound guy. Okay. Yeah. And she and I became very close. That's Maria Corda with the blonde hair back there. She, Maria was a very famous star in Poland. She was known in Poland and she escaped a concentration camp. Okay. So she was a very interesting person for me to get to get to know. That's her with the, uh, with her arm there, yeah. And okay, and, and, and now, you know, to, to, to all us Night Rider fans, it's difficult to this was This was a hard scene for me, believe it or not, this scene right here, because 
on the stage, if you react to something, you keep it going and it looks normal, but I didn't like how they cut this because it, it looked like I was make to me, it looks like I'm making stupid faces. And so I, I have trouble watching myself because I know what I was doing, but it's not how it reads. Oh, okay, okay. But how, how was it? How was it being in kit? Uh, did, did, uh, did you know the show from, from before? Uh, you, you... I did. Yeah. Yeah. I did, and um, I was familiar with David, and um, and uh, the the cars, the kit cars. They had different cars for different shots. So there was the interior shot of the dash. There was the right side of the car, the left side of the car, the car that you drive. Like you asked me, how did I slide over in the seat? There was no console in that car. No, <laughs> it was rigged. Yeah, to, to make it, it easy. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So they had a variety of cars here that they used for different things. That's that's for sure. Yeah. But I wasn't paying that much at the time. I wasn't paying that much attention to that. You know, of course, I'm concentrating on my work as an actor. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's perfectly understandable. Uh, when, when when you were in the car in the scene like, like the one we see right now, uh, I guess David Hasselhoff wasn't driving. It was being towed. Yeah. So we get so it's called a dolly pull. So they attach a dolly to the front and the dolly drives and there's a camera on David's side, a camera on my side, and it's like a three camera going front, left and right. Yeah, so, but, but there, 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 all, there, there must also be takes where we have cameras in front of you. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It, would, uh, would, uh, would that be totally different takes from, from the ones with the cameras from the side? It depends. So when you're in the car like this, they're, they don't want to go back and redo this. So the camera is going to be here. The camera, So it's all going to be done. If we have to cut and do it again, the setup is the same. Yeah. So your car just keeps driving. Yeah. But if you're if we're doing a like when me and David were at the um, with the uh, phone, the trunk of the car and I had a, I wanted to take the phone. Those are all angle shots. So I'm talking, you're seeing my face, but I might not be talking to David. I could be talking just to camera right. Yeah. So those are the different shots there. Yeah. 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 So uh, do yeah. you remember if there were any special rules regarding the hero car, you know, the, the, the car with a dash, um, who could get into it and, 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 and such things? No, all I no, you did not get in that car unless you were told to get in that car. It was treated very carefully. And um, I remember... Um, You know, I remember one of the guys who worked on the cars, I guess one of the mechanics um, saying to me, you know, you know, be careful, kid. Don't, you know, don't start, you know, playing to touching all the buttons. I'm like, all right, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> This was real. This yeah. was uh, at the actual police station. Yeah. It was not it was not uh, the soundstage. This was a tough scene, too, because for some reason I couldn't hit my mark. You know, your mark is when you're walking and then you stop. But on the floor, they put a tiny piece of tape. And at the time, you know, I didn't ha I didn't know I needed glasses. I kept looking down because I, I couldn't see the tape. <laughs> and we had to do this scene a few times because of me. But they got the shot they wanted. But I love I love my line here when I say, "Piece of cake, I'm out of here." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you really nail it. <laughs> But, 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 it's how we it's how we speak at home. You yeah. know? <laughs> okay, we get we get to a, a point now where you get it, you get into the hero car and we get a fantastic look from behind of the dash all lit up and you push a button and and the and the, um, uh, the t tops they, they they open up. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll try to see if I can pause it. Was that just well? Okay, this is just a, a piece of equipment. I, I guess you, you you know we're all stunned by by, by, by the fantastic car. Um, this was a few shots. I think this was rear view. Another shot, complete different setup, was hitting the button. The next shot was the camera on top of the car looking up. Um, but it was not, this was not a continuous scene. This was all chopped and put together. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, 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 but a very nice look. Yeah, I knew. Uh, do, uh, do you remember how, how the, the T-tops went up? Or was that by, by, by some wire? Or was it, uh, was, was it was it some sort of automatic? Uh, um... No, that was auto that was automatic. Okay. I'm almost positive, if I remember correctly, yeah. they they did something and it did that. Yeah. Um, I'm don't you know there's going to be a Knight Rider fan that says that's not true, <laughs> but I'm almost I'm almost 99 
positive that some, that it, it happened as we were looking up. Yeah. yeah you, you know, you know, we're so lucky because it was it was uh, 38 years ago. So so uh, no one will, uh, will 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 punk you if uh, if if you get details incorrect. <laughs> yeah, 38 years ago. That's sickening. Yeah. <laughs> Where did my hair go? That's what I want to know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, we're coming to the scene in, in, in just a minute. No, no, I think it, we can we can talk a bit about about the, uh, how you did, did you did you get to meet uh, Edward Mulher playing Devon? Um, no, no, I had no scenes with them. When you're doing TV, it's very very fast. Yeah. So we shot this. I think I think I think I was on a Monday through Friday, yeah. and then I I went back for what's called looping ADR, where you go in and. Well, if there was a bus passing, I'd say the line over again. Yeah. So I had two di uh, one day of looping and a whole week's worth of work yeah. on this. Yeah. yeah. But, but, so it was fast. So I, I yeah. didn't meet them, no. No, you know, you, you didn't have any scenes for them, so, so you didn't meet them. And that's Correct. just the way it works. Yeah, yeah. Any, right. any, uh, any uh, memories regarding your, your, uh, uh, the other actors here? in? in uh, yeah, him, the guy there... Um, he he was kind of in his own world. I really didn't get to know him at all. But the woman who played Martha, she was a sweetheart. Um, I remember getting aggravated with her a little bit because I thought she was overdoing it. <laughs> but she, <laughs> but she was really a sweetheart and um, and uh, just a, a lovely, lovely person to work with. Yeah. 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 So, uh, um, Mart, yeah. Uh, we did something. We tried to establish the brother sister relationship. And I remember we did something that we did at the end of the episode and I'm glad they cut it because it was really dumb, <laughs> but it was kind of like, you know, I said, that's my sister because, and that's my baby brother. And we like kind of did this thing together, but it was <laughs> yeah. so, thank, thank you for cutting it. I am mean, so grateful. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he sells me away. And yeah. I think maybe he was a good, really good actor because he didn't want to get to like me and know me. Sometimes as an actor, when you really know somebody or you like somebody, it comes through whether you realize it or not. It's all internal. Yeah. So okay. he kept his distance from me, and I, and I appreciated that because I didn't I didn't want him to like me, and I didn't want that relationship. You know, these two nuts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's it's kind of funny what's going on there in order to to uh, to, to keep it all professional and 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 to keep it all as 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 pristine acting as as. Uh, as possible. Look, it's it's night rare, right? This is not gone with the wind. So you, but you have to bring, you have to find it. No matter what you're working on, even if it's comedy, you have to find the truth. Because when you have the truth, and you say it, people resonate with the truth. If you say something funny and people laugh, why are people laughing? Because what you said was true. And so it's the same thing with acting. I had to find a way to say, you have a talking car. Like I had, I remember that was a challenge for me because I wanted it to be real. And so I tried it a thousand ways from Sunday. You've got a talking car, but wait, stop. You, you have a talking car. Yeah. You know, there was a thousand ways to go. And so that's the challenge as an actor, but TV doesn't have time for all that crap. Let, let's move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so, so how, how did it work? Um, did, 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 did you have a, you know, a, like a wagon of your own for the week or how, how did that yeah, work? Yeah, I, I had my own trailer yeah, and trailer. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, thank God I had my own trailer because we'll get to the part where I got sick. <laughs> I look so much forward to it. <laughs> which, is, which was not the funnest day of my life. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That was crazy, crazy. Um, yeah, now I think. But what was what was that normal? How how many besides the regular cast got a trailer? If you're a guest star, you're treated very well. There's, there were people waiting on me. See, here's the problem. Here's why people take drugs. <laughs> There's never an excuse. But they walked around following me with a silver platter for seven days. My hair my makeup, hugging me, are you cold, putting towels around, I mean, and then we're done, and you're in your car, and you're all alone, and it, if, you know, that you've been in a mansion for a week, and now you've been put back in the shack, yeah, yeah. that's the feeling, it, it's crazy, I can't even explain it, 
but it can be a lonely feeling. Okay. But uh, I got a trailer because I was a guest star. But if you were, it's, it's, it's guest star, co-star, feature, meaning you might have one line. So the co-stars and the featured got like a little, a little piece of a trailer. Like one trailer might be divided into three. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, had my own. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and that was a trailer that was driven from, from location to location. It's the studio. Right. Correct. It's universals. And then they, they drive it to the set. Yeah. And uh, that's where I got dressed. That's where I could take a shower if I wanted. I had my own bathroom. How, yeah. how about the working hours? How, how early did you begin? Do, do you remember? I had to be on, remember having to be on set. I think my call time on day one, I had to be on set at six, which means I had to wake up. I had to be in makeup at five, which means I had to wake up at four, be in my car by 4.30 and drive to Covina from Studio City where I was living at the time. Yeah. So you, it's, it's grueling. Yeah. You're nervous. Do I have my lines right? Do I look okay? Am I confident? You know, you have to, you're constantly on. Yeah, yeah. This was a, yeah. David was mad. David was mad here. Okay. okay. How come? <laughs> it was really hot. And the director, uh, for some, something was happening technically, and we had to keep redoing it. And, he, and I think he says, can we effing get it right this time? <laughs> so he was <laughs> He was really pissed there. I remember that because I got scared. I got a little scared. I was a, a little intimidated for the first time, but he was cool. Yeah, uh, but I guess you you weren't you weren't at the the vacant lot when when uh, when when this scene happened. Uh, that, that, that that was probably. I was, uh, uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I was watching this. Okay, I, I, okay. There was there were chairs. Yeah, there were chairs off to the side. Yeah. And I watched the stunt. I wanted to see the stunt. I was still a young guy. I mean, I was, all that stuff interested me. I mean, how do they do that? You know. Yeah. So okay, that, 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 that's fantastic that you've already that you've actually seen some of some of the stunt work. Um, yeah, the sun was going down here, and my face had to be in the light, and uh, we were losing light. He, he was mad about that too because we wanted to get done. We didn't want to have to do this again. No, no, of course. <laughs> okay, uh, there's a scene now where, where where you really want to to bring your your payphone uh, in the trunk of Kit, and Kit says no, and 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 the um, uh, the, 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 the trunk the, yeah the, the the trunk closes quite abruptly. Um, um, how did they do I, that? I, I have to admit, I don't remember that. Okay, I, you know, I, I have a, I have a uh, Pontiac Trans Am like, like that one, and I, I say, yeah, yeah, it must have been some, some kind of special feature. Um, yeah, so, no, that this that I didn't, I don't remember because, um, yeah, there could have been just been a stunt guy pulling out a, sh a string you couldn't see or something. Yeah, and of course, it, you know, you just add the bump. Um, uh, on the sound stage, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so but you see, that's one shot right here. This is the master shot yeah. of the whole action. And then this, there were a few setups here. That's a, called a cutaway. Here's a second setup yeah. where I'm talking to David. That's two. Then there should be same shot. Then there should be a David setup. So there were three setups for this. Yeah, yeah. When they, see, they're number three. Yeah, yeah. So they're... So, 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 so when you're speaking there, uh, it's probably not to David Hasselhoff. You know, sometimes the actor likes to support the other actor. Yeah. Like I always, I choose to do there. So, so people are responding to my energy because it's the same energy that we've shot through the whole thing. So I like to be on camera right to the actor or camera left, but it, you don't have to be there. You could just look to camera right and the script girl reading the lines, she reads the lines and you just respond. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think David actually, I want to say he was pre very present. Yeah. He was present for me. Yeah, he was there. He, he, yeah. Almost, you, almost. you also have a lot of scenes with, uh, with David and you, you are in this, uh, in this uh, episode almost all the time from, uh, from, from the sixth or seventh minute. It's uh, you, yeah. you, 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 you have very much screen time, um, right? Also with David, and and also with the cars, uh, either other in, in 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 scenes where where the where, where the kid cars are present or, or driving the car. Um, yeah. so, so I think you 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 must be one of the actors that has uh, been on Night Rider that, that has had the most time 
uh, in and, and around the uh, uh, cars. So, yeah. So 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 so, so again, we we have a scene uh, in in the car. A lot of cameras around you, probably. Um, do, yes. Do, do you remember what was it? Was it the car with a with a nice dash? You know what we call the hero car. Every time you were in, uh, uh, you 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 were. Uh, no. 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 Sometimes it was. It looked kind of crappy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think, um, I think I think that they had invented the the sticker dash. I think we call it. <laughs> yes. Every every time you see, every time you see kit like this right here, that's called a cutaway. So you can take a cutaway and always add them in, right? Yeah. And so um, so it's really not the actual car at that time. It could be a different car altogether. I remember one car. There was tape up below, and it was you know it was it was more utilitarian for the sake of filming. So and then in a in a short while you get to drive kid as well. Um, yes. um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's a great scene. Yeah. Here's where I'm set. This yeah. this is the scene. This is right here. Look at my face. How pale I am there. Yeah. I just came out of the trailer after being sick all morning. This is the first shot after David helped me and gave me Pepto Bismol tablets. We could see how pale I am and uh, sweaty on the forehead. Yeah. That was, I started getting better from this point on, it, the shot. When you started out, did you get to roll j just a bit uh, in, in the car? What was yep. that the hero car? Or was it, I think it looked like a, like, like a round steering wheel. Yeah, it was, a, it was a round steering wheel. And so when I got in the car, um, they would say an action and pull away. And I would go forward. And then the rest of it was going to be the stunt person. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so even if it looks as if, as if Tino has a, a nice, uh, spectacular ride in, uh, in Kit. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's I'm being, but when you do see me like this, I'm being dollied. Yeah, That's a dolly yeah, shot. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It was still fun to ride in kit. Yeah. How, how was it? How was it acting? Uh, you know, you, you just should uh, act act like like like, like, uh, like you're driving. I had to act. I had to act. I think in this scene, I I had to be very angry at Kit because he was taking away my ride. Yeah. I wanted to do it my way, but he was going to give me make me nervous. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's yeah. that was the. So, that was the uh, yeah. thing, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember. If, yeah, tr try to see how, how fast you move from one side of the car. I'll just, I'll just remind <laughs> you just a bit here because, you know, I, have, I also have a, a, a car like this and, and you don't, especially with, a, with, with, with this big dash, you don't just move from the driver's side to the passenger side. But try, try to have a look at it here. It, it works. Well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's magnificent. Gosh. Hollywood magic once again. <laughs> this was this was the first day. This was day one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but it must have been the afternoon because uh, from the morning you it were, was you were you weren't very good and we will get to that uh, <laughs> in a minute. You're right. I just you're right. I, I just flopped right over there. Yeah. yeah. There was probably no dash in it. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. It's Hollywood magic. <laughs> That's what I said. It's Hollywood magic, and I'm sure if there was a dash, they probably said to me, "Hey, kid." When you're going to the other side, don't bump into anything, or we're gonna have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah. they called me the punk, the punk kid the whole time. The punk kid, I love it. <laughs> these uh, th these night driving scenes, you, you you know, I don't know how much you can see. Uh, uh, it's a, it's yeah. a lot of light in here, but but uh, was that done on a stage? Um, this was this was actually this was another. This was the last day of shooting in at Universal in the soundstage. Yeah, yeah. All, all, the interior shots, not the of course when the car is driving at night, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love this scene. This was a lot of fun to shoot. This was early in the morning. The sun had just come up. I think this is like the third day. I love the fact that I got to rob an apple. <laughs> Is that the, is is that on the Universal back lot or do you know do you remember? No, was this was on look. This was on location in some farmland. I don't know where the hell they took us that day, but I think uh, I drove. I didn't even drive to set. I think I was limousine there from Universal, so I don't even know where it was. Yeah. But uh, yeah, this is where I hot wire the car. I think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it it looks. Uh, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, it's coming in in, in a few minutes. 
So I think maybe we should. Uh, it, 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 it will not be, I think, that long before um, before we get to to the gypsy camp, and and you've got the your uncle Stefano, um, uh, Giorgio Tozzi. Um, Giorgio Tozzi, yeah. Yeah. Any uh, any uh, memories regarding uh, regarding him? <clears throat> Pure class, class. A gentleman, professional. He had his lines down. He shook my, he was delightful, delightful man. Yeah. As you know, he sang uh, all the pieces from South Pacific, yeah. the movie. Yeah. So um, lovely, lovely human being. Yeah. I loved him, yeah. yeah. So, I was upset when he died a few years back, yeah. yeah. This was the gypsy camp. Yeah. And, and uh, that, this, that was, was, this is universal. Yeah, yeah. This is universal. So the psycho house, is across the street. <laughs> I think we, we get a glimpse of it. So, but that would be the hero car, as far as I can see from here. Uh, you, you would be arriving in the hero car. Um, um, I don't know if, yeah. you, if, if you switched it from uh, from the exterior scenes to to uh, to, to the close-ups. Uh, no, it was the same. This was the same. The same car was used for this entire segment, except the cutaways. Yeah. 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 yeah David says goodbye. This was this was the longest shot we had. Um, this, there was a shot that we did here. That was the we had to do so many takes to get it right. But this this was a long this was a long morning. Plus, we had all the tourist buses coming by, and they were stopping to watch, and they were interfering a little bit. So yeah, this is where uh, I work with Giorgio, and I wish my Italian then was as good as it is now because I would have liked to you know spoken to him in Italiano. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, um, in a minute you uh, you get uh, left alone, and uh, and the three bad guys, the three, the three bank robbers, they are there uh, once again. Um, w when I watched the scene uh, yesterday, um, it looks as if they got a pretty good grip on you in in that scene. It was, was that they did. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was sore <laughs> the next day. Well, David, David was a professor, David Provo, who was on Sopranos. He was very careful. He's like, all right, let's rehearse this because it's got to look real. So we're going to hurt. We're going to grab you. I'll grab your hair. Does that hurt? And I'd say, no, that's fine. But I'll grab your arm so I can lift it a little so that you don't get the pull. So that it looks like you're pulling. Yeah. But um, it, I got banged up. <laughs> <laughs> it really looks as if you get as if you get banged up here. <laughs> my my old Italian aunts were calling my parents after this scene, going, "What did they do to Paulie? He looked like he was so hurt in that scene. I'm like, yeah. it's acting." <laughs> <laughs> uh, now he's heading to the psycho house, yeah. which is up there on the corner. Yeah. yeah. And you're in the gypsy camp, way one. And I'm in the gypsy camp. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, in a few, uh, in a few oh, seconds now. That so. stupid jacket, I was so hot. Oh, my God. But, you know, it's, uh, you look back at this and and you just, you know, you complain at the time, it's hot, it's this or that, but I'm so grateful for the experience. There's Bobby Miranda, David. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it not, did. it's not done. We're getting back to you being beaten up. <laughs> David kept David Proval kept saying to me, you know, why don't you try to cry here? And I'm like, no, I don't want to cry because Tina wouldn't cry. I'm going to punch you in the face is what I want to do yeah. and escape, you know. So, uh, and this is where he's telling me where the where I, where I would have. No, this is when um he doesn't smell the gasoline yet. That's later. Yeah. God, I um, can't believe it. years uh, ago. Um, uh, during the day, um, how much time did you have off? Or so, so here, here they're, they're, they're really going at you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm leaning in. Yeah. I'm leaning in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> d d during uh, during the day. Oh, and, and they continue. It's not good. <laughs> um, during a shooting day, how much spare time would there normally be for you to rehearse oh. lines and, and, and things like that? One whole, you know I mean, you can spend a whole day on a set and only do three scenes. Like the day is spent waiting. 
and you know you 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 have to make sure that you keep your energy up. So between all these takes, I was shooting a lot, so I was busy. But there are people, you know, that, you know, you just have to keep your energy up. You sit on the side, you get you get into your chair, you read your lines, you. But there's a lot of waiting, a lot of waiting. It takes you know a good 15, 20 minutes, sometimes a half an hour to do the next setup. Yeah. Each setup takes a lot of time. And the danger is going to the crafty table because you don't want to eat all day. Did you make it? Uh, if, if, there, if there was a schedule for one day, did you always make it on that one day? Or, or, or was it uh, was um, something that yeah, was so, running over time? So um, there's something called a shoot around. So when I got sick, they, they said, stop, our schedule is going to change. Let's do a shoot around, Paul. Let's do these scenes instead, which we can do, and then we'll go back to the setup. Yeah. So, yes. So they, it's, it's, it's changeable, but the studio doesn't like it. Yeah. They want you to remain on schedule. You know, every time they say cut and have to shoot again, that's money. So they want this thing done. Minutes are money. Everybody's getting paid big union bucks. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I think that uh, we might uh, we might get to uh, to the point now where you should tell about the first scene that uh, you had to shoot. Um, yes. Yeah, because it's coming it's coming in a, yeah, in a few. Yeah. Minutes. When I got to the set, I it was about it was had to be in the '90s. I had a corduroy jacket on because it was supposed to be the fall, and I was um, or Christmas time. And uh, I was nervous. Um, I had a cup of coffee and apple, all acid. The windows of the car had to be shut. And my lines were, let me out of this car. I'm going to be sick. That was the first shot, which was like, if I had to pick any shot that I wouldn't want to do first. So you keep saying, take after take, let me out of the car. I'm going to throw up. I'm not kidding. Let me out of this car now. Let me out. All of a sudden, because you know, the creative brain, the right side of the brain hears it and processes it. It doesn't always know what's real and not real. And so you convince yourself enough that you're sick. After a while, I said, stop the car. I'm not kidding. I think I said out loud in the set. I go, I'm not kidding. I'm going to be sick. <laughs> and I finally, I opened the window. The guys thought I was joking. I was fooling around, but I threw up all over the car. <laughs> Okay, I need, we need to hear some reactions. How did how did people around you react on that? <laughs> Bobby Miranda, I remember going, "Are you all right, kid?" David and uh, the other one, um, they, uh, Stephen, they were like, "Whoa, holy crap, kid! The kid's sick." Hold on, everybody. The director comes over to me and he goes, "This isn't." You know, I hope you're okay. Do you have the flu? And I said, no, I don't have the flu. It's the line. I'm going to throw up. I can't keep saying that. You made me do it five times. I can't keep saying that line. <laughs> goes, this isn't New York. This is not method acting. Don't method act. I'm like, I'm not method acting. It's just, I can't say that line anymore. So <laughs> I went back into the bushes and I threw up again. He goes, look, we're going to do a shoot around. Go to your trailer, get rest. We'll see how you are later. But the prop people were mean. Oh my god, they had to clean it up. They were not nice to me. <laughs> and I can't blame them. I would have I would have dogged me too. Yeah. They were saying things to me like, Oh, here's your big chance. You lost your chance for a spin off. That's too bad. I'm like, you know, yeah. why don't you kiss my ass? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so uh, uh maybe There it is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, See, I <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah it's uh yeah it's very memorable i'll say the, the least <laughs> so and here, here's uh, here's where you uh, you hot wire the car um yeah it's uh, you, you you're in the car driving it just for a few feet or something like that i i, I guess it's not you uh, banging into the haystacks no that was uh um jack gill again yeah you can you can see the difference. I mean, they did a very good job. You know, it's hard to tell. There, that's me. Then you could tell that that's Jack. I mean, 
See, you could t- I could tell by the wig. Yeah. That's all. That's Jack Gill. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I I only got to back up. Yeah. <laughs> can you uh, can you talk a bit about the, about the, the the relationship with David Hasselhoff? Um, um, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. David was David was always a gentleman. Treated me like I was his guest. You know, he came up to me the first day when I got sick, knocked on my trailer door and said, are you all right? What can I do to help you? He goes, don't let them get to you. You're not quitting this job. He said, just stay there. Take these. This should help. Don't worry. He was just he became like he was like a security blanket in a lot of ways. He because I knew when David was around, I was, you know, safe. And uh, because, you know, these crews, they can be, you know, this is not cuddly especially with another guy with the women they're they're you know women they treat them like gold but you know if you're a guy you you know they're rough they're it's a rough crowd so um but i i carried myself well i mean i did all right uh, but david was great we had beautiful conversations we talked about acting sensitivity um somebody screamed from the street i think night rider sucks and it hurt him so bad his face just dropped and i remember saying to him Why are you letting that get to you? Of course, we're gonna, there are going to be people that are going to do that. Yes, there are. Who cares? Where are you? And where is that person standing? So, so take a deep breath. Don't let it be very sensitive. He was a sensitive man. And of course, subsequently, we know his history. Um, but that's part of that, you know, addictive personality where you take everything to heart and you're overly sensitive. Lovely man, and I got to meet Catherine, and she was just gorgeous, beautiful, and the sweetest thing I'd ever met. And I met her and Morgan Brittany the same day. They both came to the set. So, but David was David was awesome, an A plus guy. I mean, he and he fooled around on the set a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we're, we're driving in the car, that scene where I'm falling asleep, he we, he reached over and says, "Come here, baby, and give me a kiss." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We had a cut. Yeah. <laughs> I go. <get> it. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's usually what 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 uh, I hear and, and what one can read from from the from the actors that's been on Night Rider that, that, that David that David has been been fun and and very nice to work with and and that that the overall um, mood of the show and mood of the of the recording and and, and the whole uh, shooting scenes it's it's been it's been uh, it's been good it was a a plus experience yeah. I, it was a plus i think out of all of my tv work this was my favorite set yeah. definitely because yeah. some sets they all have a consciousness of their own they all have every set has a story and it depends upon who's running it yeah. this was playful fun kind compassionate all the things you want yeah, yeah as hard as tough as everybody as, as tough as everybody thinks that they are it was still all of those things yeah. you know and you can also say that that's actually what comes through when you watch the show and and i think a, a very large portion of the of the reason for the show being being a hit um, because all the things you mentioned uh, it kind of yeah it, it rolls right from the screen out and out, out into the living rooms Right, so, right, yeah. and uh, I think this is where uh, this is where I, I end up in the cornfield, right? Yeah, it, I don't is. Remember. it is, yeah, yeah. It will not be that long now because uh, you 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 forget to look at. Uh, at oh, this is Eye of the TV. Tiger. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Do you remember this sitting in the in the car? And, uh-huh. <laughs> well, th- that well, that wasn't playing, of course. They said, "All right, kid." Make believe you're listening to your favorite song, and just we want you to dance while you're driving. And I'm like, all right, yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we get we get to the scene in the cornfield. Um, yes, this is where I tried to do my first my stunt by myself. I had to fall into the. Did I write about this in my book? I don't think so. I had a, I had to fall into the, dive into the bushes there. Um, And I said, I can do it. Let me do it. You're very Tino. And my director, Bruce, was like, no, let the stuntman do it. I can't afford anything to happen. I'm like, what's going to happen? I'm, ju- I'm jumping into a bush. He goes, all right. And sure enough, I jump and I, I hurt my knee really bad. 
Yeah, you have, you have a running there, there as well. It's being chased by yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is the stunt right here. Let me just see what they did here. I forgot. Oh, I'm already in. They didn't even show it. No, I, I so I'm already in the I'm already crawling. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that there is another scene where, where you jump, probably to uh, to avoid the, um, uh, the, the the corn harvester. So, so I, I, this... I, I think that, that, that there is a scene. Um, we have a scene here as well with, with, with the kid doing a turbo boost into the corn. Were you present when, when that happened? I was. Oh, yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I was. It yeah. was very cool. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. It, it, it just it was an, it was amazing to see the stunts and stuff. But this was my favorite. This, the last scene when David, right? This is the last scene, one of them. I, I, it's my favorite. It was my favorite thing to shoot because I love the fist fight. <laughs> and I loved, uh, I was on David's back and we were punching the bad guys. And it was just a lot of fun. I, I remember laughing my ass off and it just had a blast. Yeah. So, this, so, this so, was so great. You, 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 you did get to do some, uh, some uh, a bit of stunt work yourself. I try, I tried, try, I tried and failed, and then, um, and then, I remember my knee was killing me there because I heard it, and then, uh, I loved this day because all my friends had come to watch me shoot. I got them passes to come. Okay. Yeah. And. Yeah, this is the uh, this is it. I think when the yeah yeah we, we got, we got that the, took a little while. I remember that that took a little while to shoot. I think I think, I think that, yeah. uh, that, that there's a lot of miniature work in 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 that uh, in, in, in that uh, take. In, in that yeah. So yeah. Um. It's it's funny because you know these guys were great. It, when you when you are when you are an actor too, you know. People say like, you know, there's a Meryl Streep who takes on like all these different roles and she can do anything. But casting directors want to get as close to the character. So they're going to look for what's real in the person. Yeah. So these guys all played thugs and stuff like that was their claim to fame. This was great. I loved it. And, and a happy ending. That's what we like. And a happy, yeah. and a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is where she did that stupid thing with me that they cut. Okay. <laughs> or I, might have, I, keep, I always think of that because it just irritated the crap out of me. And I really hope she doesn't watch this. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, was, it was here, yeah. This is my goodbye to day. This is my goodbye scene, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's the last scene of, uh, of, of the episode. So, uh... That shirt I'm wearing was my friend John's. He goes, what are you... That's my shirt. I go, yeah, you gave it to me. <laughs> okay. So, um, a, a, any memories on uh, on on that turbo boost from the last uh, from the last scene? Uh, I, I would love to hear if, if you can remember the the stunt crew. Uh, how, I don't. Or, I or... I don't. And sometimes I I confuse things that are, you know with reality. It's just like I remember so many stunts and so many things, um, but I don't remember specifically. I don't. I just remember watching these incredible things happening and just being in awe how they do it. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I was worried the whole time somebody was going to get hurt. That was my always my fear. Yeah. <laughs> I worried for Jack. Yeah. This was it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> See, you, you could become a good kid overnight. Yeah. I love it too. I had, I had a humbling experience. Yeah, and it, it was, in, as I said before, it was indeed a very memorable role um, of, uh, of Tino. And, and you, really, you really nailed it. So, uh, so. Thank you. I, I, what I find amazing, Jacob, is that, um, you know, and this was because of um, Mark Pruitt in, um, at the Southern Knights of Atlanta had invited me to a Night Rider thing. And I'm like, what the hell is it? Why would I go to that? It's just like, who's going to be there? Like three people? Like, I was so surprised at how many people globally still are into Knight Rider. And I had no idea my episode had made an impact. And Mark had told me that it was like almost a little bit of a cult classic with Knight Rider fans, a fan favorite rather. Yeah. And so I, I, I had no idea. This was only a couple of years ago. And then after that event that I went to and spoke at with Catherine was there and one of the producers, then I got all these invitations online and it kind of became 
you know, and I like to, I like to be available to fans. I think that that's, you know, that's why you do it. You, I don't just do it for the money or it's not about me and the art. There's a responsibility to other people. Yeah. And I, I believe that. And if I've brought somebody joy or a little boy happiness while he was laying in bed sick and watched my episode, then it makes me happy. And that's what it's about. Yeah. You know? It is. So, you know? yeah. And, uh, and now we, uh, yeah. We, we've got your, your, all your words on this fantastic episode. Um, Great. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been fantastic. Uh, I don't know if there, if there are any, uh, any last memories that, that you'd like to, to, uh, to bring forward. Um, no, you know, just overall and in general, the whole Knight Rider experience was a highlight of my life. Um, the way you guys respond to it is the way I respond to it um, the same way because... It was such a phenomenal, it was such a phenomena. And uh, I think I shared with someone in Australia, at first when I was called to, sh to be on this, coming from the New York stage, of course, I came to Hollywood to do, you know, King Lear. And so when I, I go, Knight Rider, I said to my agent, I go, Real, really? Like, Knight Rider? You know, not Knight Rider, uh, Airwolf. I go, Airwolf? Well, I guess I'll go. And then we want to see you for Knight Rider. And I'm like, all right, well, listen, if this is the way it's rolling, but then I watched Knight Rider and I enjoyed it and I became a fan of the show in my own way. But um, last thoughts, it was, it, I couldn't be more grateful. And I don't know how else to say it, not only for 1983 when we shot it, but for everything in between and for the resurgence of affection and fanfare that exists now. So I am very grateful, grateful to people like you. And um, this is my joy. So yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, I can definitely say on behalf of all the Night Rider fans out there that it's been a fantastic pleasure to, uh, to have this conversation with you. Uh, we, now thank you. Have, we now have the Paul LaGreca commentary of, uh, of uh, uh, Silent Night. Uh, that's the first one. Um, I love it. It's fantastic. Awesome. So thanks so awesome. much for, for taking the time to do this. Thank and, you, my uh, friend. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. As, as Tina would say, piece of cake. I'm out of here. <laughs> and now, while we listen to Joe's selection of Knight Rider music that we received directly from Don Peak himself, we'd like to thank these Patreon supporters. Look at you guys scrolling up the screen to my right. Wait a minute, how can you tell which side is my right since you can't see me because I'm not on camera? Oh well, you know what I mean. We're featuring these fine supporters at our Knight Rider prop restorer level. Thank you very much for your support. And for those of you at the Knight Rider history hunter level, we're recognizing you right now in the description. Now if you enjoyed seeing this golden nugget of Knight Rider history being rescued from obscurity, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Your support would empower us to bring you even more of these historical nuggets. We are the Knight Rider Historians. Till next time, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.